Right, so therefore, the talk is called The Road to Code, so I should start with a picture of a road. Um, this is actually about 10, 15 minutes walk from my house. There is a guitar shop just off to the right here that I use. Um, but that's not what we're here, <coughs> here to talk about. So we're here to talk about code um, and how we get there and the consequences of that journey. And I also intend to touch on a number of things that are relevant to the um, three courses that I will be doing. This, uh, so architecture with agility, that brings into mind the question, architecture, um, agile processes, what is the relationship? What do we mean by architecture? What is really the kind of the core of um, an approach that is agile? For many people, they identify something like agile with, with a single approach, Scrum, but that's never been the vision. Um, and that's certainly not the way that I view it. Um, it is a, uh, it's a deeper statement of the relationship between our activities and the flow of time. Um, but it also relates to some of our practices and the details of those. And when it comes to this, the code level becomes significant. There is the aspect we're gonna find of knowledge and how we organize knowledge um, the structures and approaches we take in our code, um, uh, so programming paradigms, um, the uh, variety of thoughts that exist in that space. And there's also the idea that much of our knowledge of development um, comes from the past. We, um, we build up experience. Uh, perhaps one of the things in software development we're not as good at doing is communicating that experience to others and building on it. So in other words, the idea is that most of what you can do now is because of things you have learned or other people have learned in the past. Um, this feeds into the idea of patterns. But there is also another idea in patterns that supports um, a broader view of architecture and of code practice um, that is that it is empirical. In other words, it is about trying to find things that we know work. So I'm going to kind of meander around kind of software development. It's Friday afternoon. I don't want to you know, put too much on you here. So this should be um, thought provoking, entertaining and informative and should hopefully give you a, uh, an insight into perhaps what follow on course you would like to sign up to. And I think we also have time at the end for um, uh, Q&A. So plenty of opportunity there. I'll also mention a couple of things about each of the specific courses uh, when we get there. So um, yeah, that's the outside. This is me on the inside. This is what I look like when I'm standing in front of people rather than sitting in front of people. Um, and uh, I'm fairly easy to find um, uh, online, so feel free to contact me um, uh, one way or another, and you can find me on LinkedIn as well. And I'll start off with this kind of idea. I, so a couple of things that I've done in the past that are relevant. Um, Co-authored these two books, uh, Pattern Oriented Software Architecture, um, volumes four and five. Very much about this idea of understanding the things that we are building. Some people view, and I'm not going to talk about it today, but some people view patterns as just a bit of a shopping list of design ideas taken from one book that was published in 1994. Um, important as that book was, there is a little bit more to design patterns than this. Design patterns contain a way of approaching problems and thinking about them and identifying them uh, and naming them. That is perhaps one of the things that um, we as a profession um, in uh, the world of software development do a lot. We name abstract concepts. Um, some of those abstract concepts appear in code. Um, some of these are product names and others are ways of doing things. But there's also a respect and an interest here when it comes to architecture. Um, now we often think of architecture as just being the big picture, but I'm gonna try and take a different course on that. I don't think that really is what architecture is about, uh, even in buildings, but definitely not in software. Um, and the detail matters. So uh, 10 years ago, I published this one, with O'Reilly, um, a crowdsourced and open source book, uh, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. And uh, this year, um, uh, thanks to lockdown, I was, uh, me and Trisha G were able to finish this book, um, uh, 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know. Um, and uh, probably, I would say at least half of the advice in that book is applicable, whatever programming language you're using. Um, but obviously uh, uh, it has a specific language in mind um, there's more code in this book than there is in the previous book uh, because it's made its focus specific. Now, I don't just take photographs of books, although actually I do. Uh, I, do I do seem to do that occasionally. I 
run a page on um, Facebook. I do a number of other things in my spare time, including taking pictures of books and non-books. The reason I put this here is I run a, a page on Facebook that is about words and language. And sometimes on a Friday, and this is called Word Friday after all, um, I will focus on a specific and unusual word or phrase in English. Um, and I'm not going to do that here, uh, or I'll do it later in the talk. But the one I want to focus on is because of this focus, these are some of my dictionaries. I, I like books about language and usage. Um, I thought let's focus on the word code, given that I've used it in the title. Code is an interesting word because it has so many different meanings. Um, Here's an obvious one. I think we're all reasonably comfortable with that. But this is referring to the low level code. This is the bit where we talk about the binaries, where we're talking about, oh, it's the byte code. It's at that level. We are closer to the machine. Often when we refer to code, so notice we use this, the term to refer to code is what we generate from our code, um, source code. Um, so code is a shorthand for source code as well as a shorthand for binary or generated code. A, pre, a computer program or a portion thereof. A, now here's where it gets interesting. What are the other uses of code in English? A system of words, figures, or symbols used to represent others, especially for the purposes of secrecy. Now, this is an interesting one because this is sometimes true of the code that we write. Sometimes it does look like we are trying to encode our code. You look at particularly what we refer to as legacy code and is often also um, uh, listed under the heading of technical debt. We say, well, yeah, this, <laughs> this code is written in code. I don't understand it. I don't understand what it's trying to do. It's keeping its secrets very close to its chest. Um, this is the kind of code that we're not interested in uh, or would like to avoid. But here's another one. Um, code, a set of conventions or principles governing behavior or activity in a particular domain. We are guided by codes of practice, codes of conduct. Um, when we talk about a development um, process or a set of principles that is effectively a code. So the word code allows us to play, we, la we can play around with it quite a lot. Um, and I want to pick up on something. Uh, I was directed to a conversation about 12 years ago uh, with Kirk Pepperdine, um, who, as it happens, contributed to both of the 97 Things books uh, that I listed. Uh, he's a Java performance specialist. Um, so this conversation happened 12 years ago. Um, uh, I'd known Kirk for a couple of years then, but he didn't know the spelling of my name and I was not yet on Twitter. I joined Twitter uh, 19, in 2009. That's, that's right. I joined it uh, summer 2009. And we had this conversation. He said, um, interesting conversation with Kevin. And the outcome of the conversation is that functionality is an asset and code is a liability. Now, I think this is really interesting because what we're saying here is is in contrast to something that I have uh, advocated for many years, which is that code is an asset. When we say that something is an asset, we're saying it has value. Um, code is not just a way of getting software. Of itself, it has value because it encodes knowledge. Um, it's, uh, it, 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 when somebody says, in fact, we actually get the example sometimes. And I think I, the first time I saw a public company um, or a, a well-known company actually say this, uh, was Microsoft. It was in the 1990s um, when uh, there was the question of, okay, what is the specification uh, of COM, uh, their component object model? Um, and uh, uh, the point was where the specification, where there was a difference between the written specification and the binary, then the binary won. In other words, the code is the truth. Whatever we say in this document, if it disagrees with the code, then the code is right. Okay, the document is wrong and the code is right. The code is a single source of truth in that sense. Um, in that sense, we can see, yeah, clearly it has not just value, it might be the value um, uh, for a company. So that's interesting. But I think there is something else here that Kirk and I revealed in our conversation that turns that on its head and is also true. Um, to quote from a, a friend of mine, John Jagger, uh, he tends to talk about the idea that you only truly understand an idea when you find paradoxes in it, when you find contradictions. And here is a good example. Code is a liability. Uh, I think it is an asset, but it is also a liability. Now, what does that mean? Um, when um, accountants talk about assets and liabilities, 
that an asset is this is something that is a value, a liability, this is a debt or something that is against us, something that works against our assets. And so they make a, a, a very strong point of trying to make sure that the liabilities of a company do not exceed its assets. Okay. Uh, in other words, this is an important management aspect of money, but it's also an important management aspect of our software. Functionality is what people pay for. Functionality is what they use. It's what they come back for. Even when I download an open source um, uh, project, I can see the source, I can see the code, but I want, it's normally the functionality that I want. The fact that I can see the code, that's great. But what I want, I want it for the functionality. The code is a liability. It's against us. Because if you imagine, you can imagine, okay, what is it that I, what, what feature am I going to add to the code next week? You can probably imagine it really quickly. What is the thing that is preventing you from instantly, as quick as thought, putting that into the, uh, uh, into the software? Well, it's the code. The code is the thing that is going to slow you down. Of course, you have to write code. So we understand, that, like any company, there will always be a certain amount of liability. There's always something that is potentially against you. As long as that's less than the asset and as long as it's managed, that's okay. So this is why I think this is an interesting point of view because it makes you, if you realize code is a liability, it tells you immediately you need to manage it. Otherwise it goes out of control. It becomes uh, the thing that works against all of the benefits. So therefore you manage it, you watch it, you make sure you minimize it. We want less code, not more code. Now, how do we do this? Well, okay, big picture. We're going to go to Mars. We'll go to Mars later in the talk. Um, so isn't that a nice, nice picture of Mars? Uh, I'm doing this because I want to quote from Gerard Holtzman. Um, uh, Gerard Holtzman was um, the project lead for the software about, uh, for the software on the Mars Curiosity rover. So he works for NASA's JPL. And um, there's a communications of the ACM article, which is really interesting uh, and worth a read if you can get access to it. Um, uh, sometimes they don't show uh, communicate CACM are sometimes a little bit picky about whether they show an article or not. There is also a talk at that link um, where he talks about it. And what I liked amongst all the other things that he um, uh, talks about in terms of how their development practice works, for those of you that are interested, uh, Mars Curiosity, you, uh, the software is written in C99. Um, one of the things he focuses on, there are standard precautions that can help reduce risk in complex software systems. Now, first of all, this exact idea, when we talk about financial stuff, assets, liabilities, one of the other things people talk about is risk. Risk is your exposure to problems um, without any kind of certainty of what the probability is. Um, and what he highlights is there are standard precautions. In other words, we know how to do this. There's no mystery here. We know how to do this, which is sometimes not very good at following through. Um, and he said, this includes the definition of a good software architecture based on a clean separation of concerns, data hiding, modularity, well-defined interfaces, and strong fault protection mechanisms. There are five things here that he lists. Only one of these strong fault protection mechanisms is specific to the, uh, Mars, um, uh, the Mars probe. Uh, and I think that's quite interesting. Clearly, you want strong fault protection mechanisms because what happens if your software crashes? Well, you know, you have to do something like send Matt Damon out to Mars to go and reboot your probe. That's really not going to happen. So in other words, this is highly mission critical. So that is very specific to this class of software. But what I think is interesting about the other four pieces of advice, the separation of concerns, that's 1970s, that's De Edsger Dijkstra. Data hiding, that's 1970s, that's uh, uh, David Parnas. Modularity, that's actually late 1960s. Well-defined interfaces. Um, the concept of really talking about interfaces in software was very much a 1970s idea. So what we're talking about here is advice that goes back to the 1970s and 60s. Um, we already know how to do this, but sometimes we're not very good at following through. Um, sometimes we have pressures of time. Sometimes we say, well, you know what? This stuff takes time. This is, this is, gonna, uh, th this is difficult to do. We don't have time for this. It's too expensive. Um, so when it comes to architecture, I think one of my favorite quotes on architecture um, is this one um, from Brian Foote and Joe Yoda. If you think good architecture is expensive, try bad architecture. Uh, I think this is, you can almost substitute anything for the word architecture, anything that takes effort. 
because the, the question is not, are we going to pay for the consequences? It's when are we going to pay? And will pay, we pay more or less if we do it later? Um, and this idea here is that architecture is somehow a place in which we live and work. It defines the way in which we are going to build our code, the way in which we think about our tools, the way in which we interact with our colleagues. Um, just as in buildings, an architecture defines a place where you live and work. It defines the spaces and how you, how you flow through a building and the roles of different uh, places. The same is true in software. In software, we are defining how people are going to interact. So in other words, an architecture is a place where we live and it's a, it defines a model of interaction and participation for human beings. It's not just a technical artifact. And this has economic consequences. Now, when people talk about this stuff, one of the most obvious ones they highlight is when they talk about the bad architecture. They are oh, technical debt. So let's talk about technical debt for a moment. Um, the, uh, I, I made the, a point here uh, in a tweet a couple of years ago. Um, the code base has unmanaged technical debt. There are a number of things that are likely to be harder than necessary. In other words, things that will take more effort and more time and more grief. Retaining staff, security. If you have a code base, with unmanaged technical debt, what you're saying is, we're not really sure what all of the code does. We don't know why everything is there. We, some of it's a bit messy. We don't really have tests for it. We're not sure whether we can get rid of this piece of code or not. That has huge security implications. One of the, there are many aspects of security and I'm, I'm happy to, I'm gonna say, I'm not a security expert, but not all of them are directly technological. Not all of them are about things like access control lists and authentication and things like that. Some of what security is about is, do we know what we have? If somebody says, we do not know what is in our code base, then I'm gonna call that code base um, less secure than one in which we do know. Do we understand what it's doing? No, okay, well, that means we are open and vulnerable um, uh, to potential um, uh, attacks. We don't, un don't understand our own surface area. We don't understand the dependencies on third party tools and therefore the vulnerabilities in those which may become vulnerabilities in ours. In other words, we don't know enough to say this is secure. Questions of compliance. And obviously bugs, bugs happen a lot more when there's, um, uh, when there's uh, unmanaged technical debt than when there isn't. And then anything to do with change markets, requirements, technologies, in other words, all of these things become harder. But I don't want to say that technical debt is always bad. You'll notice a very careful wording there. If a code base has unmanaged technical debt, technical debt is not, technical debt can be bad. Technical debt can also be a benefit. It's, it's like debt in the real world. Um, although certainly we have far too much debt in the world. Um, my younger son this morning asked me how big is, how much money is there in the world? Uh, so it's a case of, and his brother is doing economics at university at the moment. I said, that's a question you might have to ask your brother about. But I said, it depends what you mean by money. Um, because uh, there was this observation, I think uh, it came out that the Bank of England, uh, it was revealed this week, that the Bank of England doesn't know where about 56 billion pounds is. So pretty much there's about 60 to 70 billion euros missing in terms of currency somewhere in the UK. That's a lot of money to be uh, not sure of. You know, it's about a thousand euros per person. Um, so he's thinking in terms of cash. And I said, well, actually, most money is not cash. It depends what we mean by that. Um, but I want to talk about the positive side of debt. Because actually, the reason that the original debt metaphor was used, uh, it comes from Ward Cunningham in the 1990s, 1992, to be specific. Um, Ward was talking about using debt to achieve a benefit. In other words, we Sometimes in the real world, we will take out a loan in order to get something that we would not otherwise be able to get at a time that we would not otherwise be able to get. Um, and a very simple example of that is um, uh, my house. Um, my wife and I have a mortgage um, and we have a clear benefit from that. It, the, the repayment is structured. It's visible. We understand exactly how much um, uh, money is involved, what the repayment is, and we get a benefit. We get a house. OK, so it's very clear that by taking on this debt, we have also, in other words, by taking on this liability, we have also achieved an asset, a place to live. OK. Um, however, because just as in the real world, when we talk about debt in code, often when people are talking about that, they're talking about the darker side of debt, the problem. So what I want to focus here is the difference between unmanaged versus managed technical debt. 
Uh, I actually wrote a piece in um, for O'Reilly recently. It's on the website. And I made a point because many people misunderstand the metaphor. I've had people tell me, oh, no, we understand our technical debt. And then we have estimates for our technical debt. And I said, well, how did you estimate it? So well, we've, we've estimated the amount of work involved in fixing it. And I said, that's not what debt, that's not actually the metaphor. It's not the cost of repaying, it's the cost of owning it. And that's a very different quantity. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's this idea of what happens over time. The amount that we paid for this house is actually a lot smaller, relatively speaking, than the amount that we are repaying over time. That's the, it's the question of how much debt do you carry with you? What does it mean on a day-to-day -day basis or with mortgage repayments, a month-to-month -month basis? It tells you that you can't do certain things because there is always money going out. It's the cost of the interest. So the message of the technical debt metaphor, is not simply a measure of the specific work needed to repay the debt. It's all of the time and effort added to all the past, your current work and your future work that comes from having the debt in the first place. It's not just repayment, it's a lot bigger than that. But we also get another aspect when we talk about code being a liability. We, we're talking about the idea that code itself is not just a, a weight that requires work and that we can increase or decrease that amount of work depending on our practices and our attention. Um, it, it's also to the, the actual problem of the runtime, bugs. Now, here's an interesting thing. So I introduced myself a few minutes ago. I'm gonna introduce myself again because it turns out that um, I'm, I'm a thing. Um, this is, uh, there, there is a term, a Kevlin Henny. Um, and it's actually, the, this was used at the register a couple of years ago, made three Kevlin Hennies at Waterloo Station. A Kevlin Henny is a humiliating public software failure, photographed and tweeted to the eponymous account, hence why it's an at Kevlin Henny. Um, at Kevlin Hennies are frequently seen at ATM machines, supermarket checkouts, but the best ones usually occur at transport hubs where they enjoy the full benefit of giant displays. There you go, here's one. So this is Madrid Airport. This is 2006. Um, this is a big error message. Um, in fact, it took two photographs to take it, okay? Uh, now, what I find interesting, so I took this one, um, and what I find interesting about, I, I, I've always been fascinated with failures uh, in terms of software because it's not just the cause, but it's also what they tell us about the thing that is built. So this is a large scale LED screen, okay? What software does it use? Well, when it's running, you can't necessarily tell, but when it fails, it's like when you drop something, it breaks and you kind of see the fracture lines, you see inside it. And if you look here, I don't know, what's this? For a number of years, I used to think, you know, oh, it's using the language kernel. Um, that means probably this is a Linux distribution because kernel is the language of Linux. It's not the language that Windows use. There's one fail, there's only one failure message I know of. Um, and I trust me, I've got a lot of Windows fail screens. Uh, only one, one uh, screen uses the term kernel. So I thought initially, but then somebody said, actually, I don't think that's right. I think that this is um, a Windows, early Windows, the 16-bit Windows. I did a bit of Googling around and I actually found the error message. No, this is DOS. This is DOS. This is 2006. And this is actually um, a, a, a basic, this is an add-on to DOS that is controlling. I found the exact message uh, online. So this is for TCP IP. It's an add-on module. Um, and, but so there we've learned how this is built. This is built using DOS. Um, most people will ignore all of that information. Um, you, know, they look, you know, the way that people are when you say, hey, this is free. Everybody goes, oh, free. Where can I get mine? You know, you just said free. Where do I get my five free packets? I don't know what they are, but they're free. I want them. So I got really interested in this. I used to show people pictures of failures um, at conferences and, uh, and uh, when I ran workshops. Um, here's one. This is so old. This is a screenshot. This is so old that it's Mozilla. So this predates Firefox. This is about 2007. Uh, and what I love about this one, again, it shows us a failure. I was visiting the Netherlands and I was going to go and visit a friend. I was in Amsterdam and I was going to go um, and visit a friend in Divendrecht. And uh, I looked at the train times and I wanted to go to an earlier train. But apparently there are no earlier trains. There is only java.lang.null pointer exception. So immediately what I have learned is this system is written using Java. The back end is using Java. But I've learned more than that. What I've learned is that they have not, this is a path in the code that is a problem. I, they have not got a try catch 
that converts it. In other words, a big outer try that says something like any remaining exceptions, let's, con let's put an appropriate message, you know, maybe in Dutch or in English, not in Java, you know. So it should say, I'm sorry, this isn't working right now. Not, here's a class name. Um, so it tells us they're missing something. Now, it's either a practice that they've forgotten to adopt in their code, or they're not aware of, or they're under too much time pressure to be able to do that. So maybe they're firefighting. Now, what I find interesting about this and learning about software is that a couple of years later, I did a talk at a conference in Amsterdam. Everybody laughed when I showed this, and somebody came up to me afterwards and they said, you know, they still have that bug. So what I found fascinating is not only had I experienced this, but it turns out that this hadn't been fixed in nearly two years, and everybody in the Netherlands apparently knows about it. This is like a part of the Dutch culture, this bug. Everybody knows about it. Um, so that also leads to a question. How does a wide, a, a commonly known bug not get fixed? Perhaps the software was outsourced. Perhaps they don't have enough time. Perhaps they have chaotic management. I don't know the answer, but I have a lot of very interesting questions just based on this failure. Now, they actually ended up rewriting the site completely a couple of years later. But, you know, they still have bugs. Here's a good one. Here's an order confirmation from about two years ago. Order number, null. Hey, great, this is written in JavaScript. Um, I've got another one which has undefined and another one which has NAN, um, all from uh, the Dutch one. Yeah, again, we're learning about the system. But this has got to a point where people actually send me um, examples, hence why it, you know, people will tweet at me and they will send me examples. This one's an interesting one from Canada. Um, Canada, typically uh, bilingual, English, French, actually trilingual. Um, PHP, um, we see here. Um, so here is an interesting failure. But it gets, it got to the point, so four years ago, somebody, that this is the first time anybody used this, they, people have been tweeting these things at me for a few years. Arriving in Bologna, I saw a Kevin Henney screen. Ah, that's the first example. And, and then it's like, you're never safe from a Kevin Henney. It kind of picked up after that. And somebody about two years ago put this up at um, Urban Dictionary. Um, uh, so software failure that happens in some public space and so on. Um, what I love about this is when I showed my wife, you know, hey, you know, Urban Dictionary, you can get a Kevin Hay mug. And she said, I'm, <laughs> I don't need one. I've got one. It's you. Um, so, you know, there's this. Now, this is all good fun. But what happens in the real world? Let's go back to Mars because this is all good fun. It is all in the real world. But what happens when the consequences are not just for entertainment or amusing and interesting? So let's go back to Mars. European Space Agency had an otherwise successful mission in 2016, uh, the ExoMars mission. This is an artist's impression of the Schiaparelli lander. Schiaparelli lander was supposed to um, uh, drop from the orbiter, the ExoMars orbiter, drop to the surface and would have been um, Mars's, um, would have been European Space Agency's first uh, successful attempt to land on Mars. Um, it had previously failed. Um, uh, 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 there, there was actually a British probe in the early 2000s uh, that broke away from the main European thing and crash landed on Mars. So I feel that that's a kind of metaphor for Brexit. Um, so here it was a case of like, right, let's try and um, send a more fully, a larger probe, uh, more carefully engineered. It did not go well. Schiaparelli's uh, inertial measurement unit went about its business of calculating the lander's rotation rate. When you are entering the atmosphere of um, another world from orbit, you are traveling at um, uh, something like Mars orbit, let's call it nine or 10 kilometers per second. This is fast. If you want to land, you need to reduce that to zero. So it's a violent process as you enter the atmosphere um, and it rotates just to keep it stable. For some reason, which we'll come to, the um, saturation maximum period that persisted for one second longer than would normally be expected at this stage. So something unexpected in the data. When the IMU sent this bogus information to the craft navigation system, it calculated a negative altitude. Now, wait a minute, what is a negative altitude? Negative altitude means it's below ground. So the probe now thinks it's below ground. Oh, this is gonna be unfortunate. Now, one of the really nice things about uh, ASA is that they publish uh, all of their um, data and uh, anomalies. They, I love, oh, by the way, I love their terminology. This is standard spaceflight terminology. It's used by NASA as well. Uh, refer to an anomaly, okay? Um, 
not a horrible crash, it's an anomaly. So next time you have a terrible software outage, just refer to it as an anomaly. It's a beautiful understatement. Um, and what happened is that the code was trying to judge how much this, the craft wobbled as it entered the atmosphere. You know, maybe half a degree here, half a degree there, half a degree, and so on. But something was wrong and it ended up adding up all the half a degrees. So instead of half a degree this way, half a degree that way, well, that's zero degrees. Um, it half a degree this way, half a degree that way, that's one degree, another half, one and a half. It ended up thinking that it was overturned. It added it up and the, the probe thought it was upside down. Um, as it says here, error in the estimated attitude that occurred at parachute inflation um, we, uh, made measurements with an erroneous off vertical angle and deduced a negative altitude. And I love this beautiful piece of like understatement. The cosine of angles greater than 90 degrees is negative or a negative. It's just like, why are you telling me what I learned at school? The cosine is great. Yes, it is. It's this interesting thing. So what we are discovering is somewhere in the code, we are using, we are taking the cosine of the off vertical angle. Okay, and, and that's resolving um, uh, uh, the angle um, correctly, or we hope so. We have an assumption that it's greater than or equal to zero. So let's state it as an assumption. Actually, that's not really what we're assuming. What we're assuming is that the angle is less than or equal to 90, and therefore the cosine is greater than zero. Now, what's really interesting here is that the assumption is kind of invisible. That's the thing about assumptions is that they are invisible. They, we don't see them directly. Um, now, because of the way that we write things in software and because of mathematicians, we use radians rather than degrees. So that's another thing. Again, uh, this is something my 14 year old recently learned when I told him he, he was trying to understand something and he didn't understand what he was reading. And I said, oh, have you used radians yet? And he said, no. And I said, how do you measure angles? He said, degrees. And I said, did you know there's another system? He didn't. Now, what I love about this is that it demonstrates that he had never thought to ask. He never asked anybody how many systems of measuring angles are there. He just assumed that the one he had been told is the one that there is because he saw it everywhere. Everybody uses this. Well, yes, except that's not true. Not everybody uses that. We see the same in software. Assumptions are invisible. We have two assumptions here. Um, for some people, it's just the assumption of an off vertical angle. For other people, it's like, oh, there's other ways of measuring angles. We find this all the time in software. We are uncovering things we didn't even know we didn't know. Um, let's formalize this another way. For the software to work correctly, we can explore it as precondition and postcondition. And I can, um, I can actually phrase this, uh, I can actually phrase this as an action or an operation. If the off vertical is less than um, uh, 90 degrees, then let us make a note of the result and it must be greater than or equal to zero. What is interesting is this three part rule is something that was established originally in the 1960s as a way of thinking and reasoning about code. We've recently reinvented it in the 21st century by calling it given when then, but it's identical, it's the same thing. But what, that's a great way of testing it, but it does say, wait a minute, let me ask you a different question. If it's this, then I know what the result is. What else? What about the other case? What are we doing about that? But because assumptions are invisible, we never write this. We just write this. We just use it. And terrible things happen. The fateful miscalculation set off a cascade of despair. I love that phrase, a cascade of despair. It just, you know, again, if you suffer a terrible outage, describe it as a cascade of despair where one thing causes a, a problem. The probe thought that it was underground. And it just basically said, oh, goodness, I'm fully dressed. I'm still wearing my parachute, my back shell and everything. It got rid of everything. At this point, the probe is 3,700 meters above the ground and it falls the rest of the way. Uh, yeah, this is unfortunate. So this is an interesting one because it actually highlights a number of issues. It highlights blind spots in our knowledge. It also highlights testing, thoroughness of testing. One of the most interesting results I came across a few years ago uh, in this um, 2014 paper, uh, which has a very clear title, simple testing can prevent most critical failures. Um, almost all catastrophic failures are the result of incorrect handling of non-fatal errors explicitly signaled in software. 
I think this is interesting. So it's not saying that all it's all bugs. There are other bugs that exist on the happy day scenarios. But what we are saying and what we're observing is that when a failure is catastrophic, it's normally because something bad happened, but our handling code was either missing or did the wrong thing. Interestingly enough, this result actually repeats another result that I read about about 15 years before that um, based on the Linux kernel. Um, and it turns out that most of the bugs in the Linux kernel, uh, most of the catastrophic bugs in the Linux kernel came from error handling paths because they were less well explored. But what I also find is that the analysis was on a number of systems, open source systems, distributed, so proper systems, not just toys. What is interesting is that they were able to reproduce um, uh, uh, these and catch over three quarters of them with a unit test. And that's really interesting because these systems were not necessarily designed to be unit testable. So this is an interesting point. The idea that something that is, uh, we can bring down, here's our liability. We can bring down something that is otherwise successful and well-engineered just because of a small assumption that we overlooked. And sometimes we're so focused on the big picture, we forget the details, but details matter. So um, it's kind of classic book, um, 1960s or early 80s? I'm trying to remember where, I, I read it in the 1980s. Um, I, uh, and again, in the 1990s. Normally uh, it's Robert Persig, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And it's, it's a really interesting book. Um, it's, it, it talks about quality, it, it focuses on um, kind of thinking about the world, but and it focuses on motorcycles as an example. I know nothing about motorcycles, but I, I love this particular quote. Normally screws are so cheap and small and simple, you think of them as unimportant. But now as your quality awareness becomes stronger, you realize this one individual particular screw is neither cheap nor small nor unimportant. This is a screw that is stuck in the engine. Right now, this screw is worth exactly the selling price of the whole motorcycle because the motorcycle is actually valueless until you get the screw out. In other words, the Schiaparelli probe, the cost of the, the one missing if statement was the cost of the whole probe. That's how much an if statement costs. With this reevaluation of the screw comes a willingness to expand your knowledge of it. And this leads us to this question that when we start thinking, we're just talking about bugs here, but this is also true of other aspects of code. Of all the definitions of architecture that there are, the one I like and use the most is, is from Grady Booch. Architecture represents the significant design decisions that shape a system, where significant is measured by cost of change. It's not significant by size, because when we talk in the real world about architecture and buildings, clearly we have an idea of size, it's physical. But when it comes to software, what is big? What, you know, sometimes you, you know, I, I've seen, uh, I've seen classes that are like 20,000 lines long. Um, I'd say that's too big, but they still compile. You know, it's not so big that it collapses. Whereas if you built a building the same way, it would physically collapse under its own weight. So clearly there's something else that is big that shows us the issue. And it's to do with change. In other words, sometimes we don't actually know how hard something is. It's when we try to change it, we need to move this. We need to change an assumption. Let's change the framework we're using. Oh. Every piece of code that we have is coupled to this framework. Well, that's a big change. Um, let's change our threading model. Well, that's, that's huge. Even though threading, sometimes when people think of architecture as the big boxes on a diagram, they will miss how the system executes because the execution model is like the laws of physics for your code. Let's change the laws of physics for our system. Let's change the threading model. For a lot of people, that's just a small detail. But it's not. It's absolutely huge. If you take a code base that's single threaded and you say we're going to add threads, that's a massive change. If you decide to shift from um, a, uh, a strictly, uh, if you decide to shift from a process based model to a thread based model or a thread based model to a process based model, that's huge. Changing from a coroutine to a non coroutine approach. We often think of these as small details, but actually they have architectural implications to change how the system runs how time flows through the system, that's what threading is, it's the flow of time, is an enormous change. So sometimes we don't understand how expensive something is until somebody says, could we change this? And you say, oh yeah, sure. Can you do it tomorrow morning? Mm, no, I was thinking it might take me six months. Now it's architectural, okay? 
oh, okay, this isn't just a little coding detail. This is huge. Sometimes we don't see that. And sometimes the little practices that we do, they build up. For example, um, if we, uh, if every developer adopts a particular approach to handling exceptions, and it's just a small detail, but if everybody does it, it becomes big. Um, and that sometimes can sink a project. If people have a particular approach and a set of assumptions, and that's all the way through their code, and the new people who join, they do that in their code as well. It doesn't matter what the original architecture was when people said, oh, it's like this. It turns out that whatever it is that people are doing becomes the architecture. And a lot of these big things are actually invisible. They are to do with significance. So how do we know what they are? Well, it turns out change is the answer. So our attempts to change. Sometimes we don't know what's significant until later. In other words, time. It turns out that we cannot know everything in advance. So when sometimes people think architecture is all the big decisions that we take up front. No, it's all the little ones as well that we take over time. And sometimes we only discover them slowly because they are invisible assumptions. Um, so here's a David Parnas quote from 1971. And he makes a really important point. Connections between modules are the assumptions which modules make about each other. He's not just talking about the way we normally think of dependencies. We have many tools that show us our dependencies. Here, look, this class uses this class. This module imports this module. I can see that in the tool, in the code, it's visible. But there are a lot of invisible dependencies, particularly those related to third parties and assumptions. So um, if we imagine here's our code, this is the thing we're interested in. Here's the rest of the code in our software. This is all in one sense code that we own. And probably our tools can diagram it really nicely. If we wanna see our dependencies, yeah, this is a dependency set. That's often not the only place where there are problems. There's also the third party libraries that we rely on. But for many people, it's, oh, we're just reusing that. It's not a big detail. Well, this is where the security fun happens. This is where we expose ourselves to vulnerabilities, but also accidental changes. I've had cases where people have said, oh, we were suddenly forced into a position because the third party company went, went bust um, or they changed their license and we can no longer use it. Um, or they've moved to a different version of the programming language that we're using and actually we can't use the latest version. Um, that's causing us build problems or, 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 and we're really bad at that. We're also bad at understanding what the code that we depend on, what it depends on. The JavaScript world has loads of problems with this. Um, they're not unique, but JavaScript is most visible here. But it also turns out there's a number of other visible dependence, invisible dependencies. The, the ground you build on, what are your assumptions about what you're building on? When I ask people to um, diagram, I say, well, okay, tell me about your dependencies. Very few people ever say, oh, we're, we're using, you know, we're using Java, we're using Python, we're using C, we're using, they very rarely ever say that here is a dependency. It's a huge dependency. Because if somebody said tomorrow, you know what, let's do this system in C sharp. It's like, well, no, it's all written in Java. We can't just change tomorrow to write in C sharp. That's not going to work. Oh, well, that's quite a big dependency. Well, yes, it's architectural. You can't just change it overnight. It's massive. But it also has implications. What versions are you using? Are they supported? That will tell you what other tools you can and can't use. But these are like the air we breathe. It's invisible. We forget about them. We focus on the thing that is on the screen that is the dependencies that you're importing. But there are other things we depend on that are invisible. It turns out the whole product depends on our requirements. Governance rules, they are a requirement. If somebody changes a rule of the domain or of regulation, guess what? Our code depends on that. We have to change it. Even though that doesn't have business value, it's still a change. It's a dependency. And how we have responded to that is a, a, is a part of what we're doing. So our dependencies are not just code-based. Um, but back to the code base ones, I mentioned NPM. There's, um, uh, Adrian Collier does a really nice, um, a couple of times a week, he will do a summary of a computer science paper. Uh, and I really like his stuff. Um, <coughs> it's worth signing up for. It saves you having to read it, the stuff yourself. It's not all of interest, or rather, it's not all of interest to me. So I just read things that I'm interested in. But he had this lovely quote. It's often not direct dependencies of your project that bite you, but the dependencies of your dependencies, all the way down to transitive closure. In other words, that which doesn't depend anymore. So instead of regarding architecture as something that is big and fixed, 
we need to think of it as being a collection of ideas that we need to prove. To quote Tom Gill, it's a hypothesis that needs to be proven by implementation and measurement. And when we talk about, you know, if somebody says, hey, this is going to make it, this is going to make our code, this is going to make the software run faster, or it's going to improve our availability. That sounds brilliant, but you need to build it and then you need to test it. Is this true? We made a claim. Is this true? But it also applies to other aspects. And I wish my youngest, I wish I had a time machine to go and tell my younger self this because um, there is the other assumption, which is uh, we often make claims about our architecture to do with things we never check. Uh, oh, let's do it this way because that's more maintainable. If we use this framework, it'll be more extensible. If we, act, it's just like, we've made a claim. When do we ever check it? We should go back and say, now we have six months of development in this way. Let's check, was it more extensible? Was it more maintainable? Did it reduce the bugs? What, whatever the claim was, we're gonna do this because we think it will be better. That's great that you think that, but a hypothesis is something you test, it's empirical. So in other words, architecture is not just like, I have a big idea. It's, I have a number of ideas, and they fit together to form a whole, but I need to test that those claims are true. This is about knowledge. And I, I, I like this quote from Grace Hopper. Um, she, uh, she had a huge influence on um, computing. Uh, she, many people know her as the, uh, uh, the woman who invented um, COBOL, but actually she had a deeper influence on a number of other aspects, including basically the invention of the modern compiler. Uh, and I love this quote from her. She, to me, programming is more than an important practical art. It is also a gigantic undertaking in the foundation of knowledge. She's putting it out there that programming is like, it's applied philosophy. It's like, we're thinking, but we're gonna make it real. Okay, it's not just abstract thinking, it's thinking that is made concrete. It is about organizing our knowledge. Now, if we're gonna organize our knowledge, first of all, let's talk about the things that we know. Here, there are some things that I know that I know. Then there are things that I know that I don't know. Then there are things I don't know that I don't know. Assumptions are typically things that we do not know about until something goes wrong. Oh, I did not know that. I had assumed. At that point, we discover we had assumed something. And then we have unknowable unknowns. Unknowable unknowns are things for which we do not have a process of finding out. Um, it, or rather, to be precise. So if somebody said in 2019, have you got a pandemic plan for your company? Um, <laughs> you know, it's just like, because you know, in 2020, there might be a, a huge global pandemic. Um, so uh, the point there is, um, uh, the point there is that, yeah, we don't have a way of finding out. In 2019, there is no way of finding out whether there was going to be a global pandemic in 2020. You cannot know that until it happens. Now, here's the interesting question. When we talk about how much estimates, when we think about work that we're going to do, Many people tend to think of software development kind of around here. Here's the things that I know. And then there's a number of things I know I don't know. I, I don't fully know the requirements because we haven't really spent time talking to the product owner. Um, the product owner doesn't really fully know them. It's a new idea. Um, we're gonna use a new technology stack. Now I know that I don't know everything in that technology stack, so that's okay. We tend to think of our work as the here, but actually most software development and particularly its problems happen around here. These are the surprises. These are the things we don't know how to estimate. Now, I've, this is a very simple way of putting it. This actually um, is a way of paraphrasing um, uh, what is known as the five orders of ignorance from Philip Armo. It's, it's worth reading this stuff. Um, he categorizes these zero through four. Um, the extra one that he's um, uh, added um, uh, is meta ignorance. You don't know the five orders of ignorance. Well, now you do, so we don't need to worry about that. But what we're saying here is, if I can I know everything in advance? And if I did know everything, would that be, well, there's a big assumption there. Uh, so I want to change to um, uh, the, a different discipline. One of the things that I do in my spare time um, is I sometimes write short fiction. And so occasionally I'll read a book on the mechanics of fiction. Uh, this one is by Robert McKee. It's about screenwriting. I have no ambitions to be a film writer, um, but he has a number of interesting observations to make. But I think one of the ones I really like is this one. If a plot works out exactly as you first planned, you're not working loosely enough to give room to your imagination and instinct. 
it's a really interesting idea that you you haven't learned anything you you've you're you're too constrained you're not uh, given that we're creating something creative work normally involves discovery of the things that we do not know but also pursuing better opportunities making something better um so this idea of working more loosely that we have a rough idea it means we may have a vision of our product we may have an assumption or an idea of some of the technologies and approaches and our organizing approach but that doesn't mean that's the, that's not the last word we have more to do so it highlights there is a difference and i said we come back to word friday um I talk about um this idea of um pantsers it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting word it's a it's about writing writing style uh, a pantser is a writer who writes by the seat of their pants. It means they don't work from a fixed plot. Um, it means that they are making it up as they go along. As, as the um, uh, American author Louis L'Amour was asked by his daughter, you know, when, he, when uh, uh, she was younger, he was typing along. And, and she asked, Daddy, why are you typing so fast? And he said, because I want to find out what happens. In other words, the story happens by telling the story. And there's a lot of truth in that when it comes to software. And this is in contrast to a plotter who knows everything about what they're going to do and everything about what they're going to write. If you like, there's a spectrum here. And when it comes to software, we tend to lead more towards the pantser thing. It, most of our fixed plans, our fixed plots don't work out, partly because we don't control the world. Even a writer who controls everything about the world of their story will still discover new things. But we are working in a world that is constantly open to incomplete knowledge and change. So Colton Andrews, formerly of Netflix, made this observation, it's expensive to know everything up front, but actually we, it may actually be impossible to know everything up front. That's actually a deeper uh, observation. And as I see in the, uh, the chat, applied philosopher is a cool LinkedIn job title. Yeah, I think it is actually. I think that's a really quite, quite a good one. Um, you, know, you know, if you have freedom over your job titles, put yourself down as an applied philosopher. Um, oh yes, and uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Another fun rocket term is RUD. I've featured that on Word Friday before. Uh, rapid unscheduled disassembly. It's a beautiful euphemism. You know, it's uh, it's a really, a, it, oh yeah, our, uh, you can do it for your program. You know, you, your software It's like, yeah, we experienced a RUD event um, in our deployment. Um, it, it's just a lovely way of adding a bit of terminology to hide the fact that it all went horribly wrong. Now, what happens when we don't know everything up front, but we think we do, we make all the plans. We suddenly find we have to speed up to make up for all the problems that we didn't encounter. And people have become obsessed with velocity. This is actually an extreme programming idea. Sometimes people think of it as being a, coming from Scrum. It's often used across agile uh, companies, but it's actually originally XP. Um, but I think we should also be cautious with this word um, because the word has, it has two meanings, one of which just means speed, but the other of which is more precise. And when we're dealing with technology, we should be cautious about our terminology. Um, and we should use our terms precisely. So that what is the difference between velocity? What, what do we mean when we talk about velocity? Well, normally what people are actually talking about is speed. You know, if I make the claim, I am traveling at 120 kilometers per hour. I am driving at 120 kilometers per hour. That's fantastic. But that's only part of the story. Are you heading in the right direction? If somebody says, uh, you know, uh, Kevin, what's your progress? I'm traveling at 100 kilometers per hour, or 120 kilometers per hour. That's great. Which direction are you going? I'm heading north. Kevlin, you're going in the wrong direction. You need to be going south. It turns out that 120 kilometers per hour north is actually worse than walking south. Okay, we are making, we are doing a lot of work. We look really busy, but we're building. Well, what does this mean if we take a physical metaphor and talk about it in code? What velocity really means, are we building the right thing in the right way? Okay, it may turn out that we are building the right thing, that's great, but we're doing it really badly. We are building up problems for later. We are building up debt. We may also be building something beautifully, but actually it's not the right thing for the market and the customer or whatever. Velocity is about understanding of this balance with all of these, okay? Yes, I'm, tra I'm now traveling at 90 kilometers per hour south because there's a little more, the roads are a little bit busier than they were north, but at least I'm going in the right direction and I've got a reasonable speed. Ah, okay, that's better. So we are obsessed sometimes with this quality, even though we call it velocity, it turns out most of the time we're talking about speed and we become obsessed with that. And it, it prevents us from seeing what we need to see. If knowledge is the nature of our work, discovering things, 
is a part of what we do, then we need to be, we need to respect that. Now, Christmas is coming. Here's a great book um, for your Christmas list. Um, uh, the artist, Austin Cleon, um, uh, Offer, he's done a number of books. This is his most recent, I think came out last year. I really enjoyed this. But he had a really interesting observation. It's impossible to pay proper attention to your life if you are hurtling along at lightning speed. When your job is to see things other people don't, you have to slow down enough that you can actually look. And I think in software development, because what we do in software is detail oriented. It's not just about the big picture. Software is also about the details. Um, in fact, I actually had, before I came on this call, I had to ring a, a car insurance company because they had our details wrong. They said, if there is any difference here, um, you know, I said, actually, the details are incorrect. Um, you've got my, you know, you've got my name in one place. It should be my, my wife's name. Um, and you've got a, a date that is incorrect by you know, you claimed something was the 1st of November, but it was the 24th of November. And it was all of this kind of stuff. It's no good if they say, you know, oh, yeah, but the software is mostly correct. You know, it got the right month. It was November. And, you know, at least it got somebody who was in the right house. You know, my wife and I live in the same house. So, yeah, we got the wrong person, but at least it was the right house. No, this is an error. A software is all about not just the big picture. It's that what makes software interesting and hard is that it's all about all the details all of the right details. The data has got to be right. The way it does, it's got to be right. But sometimes this is something else. It's about improving. It's about seeing the opportunity. So I'm going to pick an example from 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. Um, and there's two really interesting things about this piece, why I'm quoting it here. Uh, by Burke Huffnagel, he contributed something to the 97 Things Java book as well. And there's two things I like. One is the title and the general advice. Put the mouse down and step away from the keyboard. What he's saying here is that sometimes you can, you're can you too close to the problem. Sometimes the only way to see a better solution is to step back. In other words, exactly as Austin Cleon says, you know, if your job is to see the, if you're running, if you're traveling at high speed, you're not going to see the details. Um, the other thing is the example he uses to demonstrate this. He talks about a piece of code that he saw and the code was a real mess. And it was, and, and what I've shown you on the screen is what it looked like after he had refactored it. After he had refactored it. OK, so this is quite complex already. And how complex is it? Well, there's a dot, dot, dot here. There's a lot more code. And what are we doing? This is very procedural. It's a very procedural approach. What we're trying to do is parse a string to work out if it uses 12 hour time. We're trying to put and this is a real I mean, I can explain this, but this is actually quite difficult. This is quite messy. After he put the mouse down and stepped away from the keyboard, he came back and he said, oh, you know what? This is actually a regular expression problem. It's, it's not a control flow problem. It's not a procedural problem. I mean, I could do that, but actually, what is it? It's a validation problem, and it's to do with a regular expression. It's a declarative approach. It's not a procedural thing. It's a declarative approach. Yeah, there's a much simpler way of doing that. And what is interesting here, I mean, sometimes people say, oh, you're using a regular expression. <laughs> I had a problem, then I solved it with regular expressions. Now I have two problems. You know, that, there's that one. Yeah, that's fine. But I want you to imagine explaining this to somebody who doesn't necessarily program or is a new programmer. Uh, uh, so I'm going to pick on my 14 year old son. He does a bit of Python. He's done a little bit of JavaScript. And if I explain what's going on here, I think he'd get it but i think he'd be quite bored and he'd be kind of going wait a minute hang on what are you doing if i explain this i can walk from the left to the right and he will understand everything i can say okay what are we expecting well we're expecting a zero followed by a one to nine or a one followed by zero to two you see i've just translated it's the description is the same this is a declarative approach i'm not having to say by the way we have exceptions then we're catching them then we're checking this and this is what happens and then and set a variable and do it. No, this is declarative. So this is about abstraction. It's about finding the right level. Sometimes people think of abstraction as being like a vague quality. That's not what it's about. Abstraction is about removing stuff so you can be really precise about what you're after, what you're really saying. Um, so an example I sometimes use uh, when talking about this is uh, let's just set ourselves a simple kind of um, simple toy problem that we might uh, encounter as a problem, 
um, uh, uh, given to us at university uh, or as a, as a learning challenge, um, we want to determine the unique words in sorted order from a list of words. So here I've represented it in Java. I've got a list of words. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an array list from that. And I'm going to sort that. So that's great. I've got the sort um, uh, uh, method available. Then there's no way of eliminating duplicates. So I have to do that myself. So now I've sorted it, I can eliminate adjacent duplicates and I have to write a piece of, so I now I have to set up some state. I have to set up another piece of state. So I've got two, so this is for traversal, this is for remembering. Then I have another piece of state here that allows me to do something else. And then I have another side effect here. And then I've got to remember to do this. Now, I'm not saying this is the hardest code in the world and compared to a million lines of code, this is clearly a lot easier. The question I ask you is not, is, not, is this hard? Is, is this harder than it needs to be? And the answer is yes. If I do it like this, then actually it turns out there uh, I can use distinct. I can say, take a, and I can actually read this from left to right. Take our list of words. I'm going to stream it so that now I can sort it, then I can get, find the distinct elements and then collect it into a list. I've got the left to right reading. Oh, that's really nice. This is the interesting thing. And I had this with a client. Um, and it wasn't exactly this, but let's just say this is around 10 lines and this is around one line. That's not exactly true. And I used a million lines. I just said a million lines. I used that for a reason. They were working on a code base that was around a million lines long. But I had also worked with another team in the same company and I'd worked more closely with them from an earlier stage in their development. And these guys had 100,000 lines of code. Now, I spent a few weeks working with a million liners before I realized, you know what? they've got the same amount of functionality. It's not that it does the same thing, but these two systems, actually, if you were to write out user stories or you were to put a, a, a fill up a spreadsheet with all the functionality um, listed off, it would be about the same size. And yet the code base was an order of magnitude different. One was 100,000 lines, the other was a million lines of code to do effectively the same complexity. You can guess which team used to go home on time. You can guess which team had the fewest bugs. You can also guess which team had the most tests, uh, the most code reviews and all the rest of it. The point here is not that this is one line and this is 10, is that if you have this coding style over a large code base, your code base is unnecessarily complex. It's not the saving of a few lines of code. It's the fact that you've saved most of your code base here. But even then, I'm gonna go back to the Dijkstra quote. There's an even simpler way of expressing this. We can actually do this much more declaratively. A tree set in Java is a set. That's what we're actually after, unique items. There is a concept called a set. We also have a data structure that orders them. In other words, that's it, we're done. This is even simpler than the streams approach. So there's two things here. One, refactoring is a progressive and gradual small thing. It's a small step thing. Many people think of refactoring as just being to do with the uh, tools in their environment. Um, but actually in a longer progression, refactoring may take place over a period of years. We come back to a piece of code and perhaps the language has changed. So perhaps we had this piece of code and we didn't want to touch it. Then Java 8 came along and somebody said, you know, there's a better solution. And then we actually realized, wait a minute, now you've made it so simple, I can see what's going on. This is what we want. Sometimes a refactoring is not a thing you do now. It's even longer. Um, an observation, um, the, uh, that has just been made in the chat, which I think is really important, is SQL is a good example of a declarative approach. Uh, SQL is actually, uh, sometimes people say, oh, it's a functional programming language. No, it's not. It's logic programming. It's actually, uh, SQL um, is a proper implementation of horn clauses. So it's actually a logic programming paradigm. So that's kind of interesting because it now takes us to one other aspect here is what we're looking at here is very much this idea of the shape of the problem, paradigms. Paradigms is a way of thinking about something, a way of showing the problem. And we looked at those two little code fragments. They both demonstrated different paradigms. It's a way of approaching a problem and seeing something about it. So if I pick up this mug from the point of view where you are now, hang on, let me just, oh no, it's not empty. I don't want to, wear, <laughs> I'm not going to empty it because uh, that's good. It's cold coffee. That's not good. Um, if I show it to you from this point of view, you can see very clearly it's a mug. Now, if I were to rotate it through 90 degrees and put it right against the camera, you wouldn't see a mug, you'd see a circle. The circle view is not very helpful. I mean, it's not false, but it's not the one that gives us the greatest insight. Sometimes when we look at a problem, we look at it from the wrong angle. 
It takes us a while to then find the right angle to see it. This also tells us in the large that when we think about things, there's a deeper principle here, how we grow a system. Um, complex systems will evolve from simple systems much more rapidly if there are stable intermediate forms than if there are not. Instead of doing one big bang change, we, do, we work through progressive changes, each of which makes sense. This encourages us to build stable systems rather than, you know, we can't release for six months. It's like we can always release. Every minute of the day, we can potentially release. Maybe it's not everything that we want it to be, but it does work. That becomes a different approach. And so our approach to development is, is not about let's put everything together all at once. It becomes let's grow it and learn from that. Now, we actually have a process. This is, I mentioned empirical processes earlier. There is actually a way of looking at this um, that is at the heart of many, many practices, uh, even if they don't know it. Plan, do, study, act, repeat. And this is a really interesting one because this is an old business practice and people keep rediscovering it, people keep reinventing it and people keep failing to apply it because it's a lot deeper than I thought. When I first came across this in the 1990s, I kind of dismissed it as just another business process re-engineering thing. But actually when the closer you look, it's, a really, it's quite educational because it also tells us the things we're not good at. In the worst case, when we are confronted with complex work, we could end up saying we're going to have a big plan and then we're going to do a lot of doing. But if we are dealing with something we don't yet understand, perhaps we should do it in smaller steps. Plan a bit, do a bit, plan a bit, do a bit, plan a bit, do a bit. We've got a cycle there, but we're not necessarily learning from what we do. This is the bit where we slow down. Again, the slowing down, it turns out it's really important. You've got to slow down in order to make good progress to get the knowledge and study. So sometimes you may come across this called PDCA, Plan, Do, Check Act. I tend to prefer the study terminology because the word study sounds slower. Study, check is a really quick thing. You know, um, have you checked that the car is locked? Yeah, it took me a, you know, it's a, yep, check. Check is quick. Study means stop and look and understand. And then based on that understanding, you do this. So the problem many people experience when they try um, say, oh, we're going to be agile, is actually what they'd end up doing is not a plan, do, plan, do, plan, do, but they don't do the bottom half of this screen. This bit's a lot harder. It's also a lot less visible. It's, you know, what does knowledge look like? But what's interesting here is this is not just about, you know, quarterly cycles or sprints or anything like that. What's really interesting about this is this actually is also the cycle of TDD which is over only a few minutes. Now, many people tend to think of TDD's test first cycle as being red, green, refactor. I tend not to find that a useful way of thinking about it. Um, I mean, it's not that it's false. It just doesn't help me understand why I want to do it. It turns out that the goal is not to get red. The goal is, let me show you, let me show you some functionality that we do not yet have. And because we do not have it, we get red. Let me implement something relatively simple that fulfills the simple plan that we have in place. Because we've done that, we get green. And now I'm gonna take a step back, but instead of having one step, I'm gonna treat it as two. Let me understand what I have and then make decisions and implement what I want to do. Consider refactoring, apply refactoring. We can actually just put, uh, frame it in terms of questions. Um, what does success look like? Plan. What is the simplest thing that could possibly work? Do. Taking a step back, are there any gaps, repetitions, inconsistencies, et cetera, Step three, that's study. And how would you address them? Make it so, that is act. So what we see here is there is a cycle here that is empirical. Um, and that idea of empiricism, is the recognition of things that we already know. So this, I'm not recommend, necessarily recommending this book. This is an important book, but it's not necessarily a highly readable book from the point of view of 2020. Um, it was published in 1995, and it, um, it, it's called Software Architecture, Perspectives uh, on an Emerging Discipline. A number of people at Carnegie Mellon University, at the Software Engineering Institute, uh, Mary Shaw, David Garland, um, uh, uh, Bass, Clemens, um, uh, Linda Northrop, a number of others, we're trying to understand in the late 80s, really trying to say, what is architecture? We keep using the word, 
software architecture, but maybe it has a more concrete meaning. And they wanted to explore this. This was also around the time, so they started talking about architectural styles. It was around the time that the patterns movement originally came out. So I always find it interesting they made this observation. One of the hallmarks of architectural design is the use of idiomatic patterns of system organization. Many of these patterns or architectural styles have been developed over the years as system designers recognize the value of specific organizational principles for certain classes of software. In other words, there is this idea that we are always learning from what we are doing, but it turns out that we can also learn from things that we already know, and we're not quite, uh, we're not as good as we could be at that. This is where the pattern stuff comes in. It's the idea of like, well, mate, how do I just, either I learn something new by reading a pattern or I use a well-known term for, to somebody else and say, hey, look, we're using this approach. We are creating a vocabulary of how to understand a system. And this idea of looking at the past is a, it's a very classic engineering idea. Glenn Vandenberg had this approach. A capsule definition of engineering independent of any discipline as you're likely to find the set of practices and techniques that have been determined to work reliably through experience. And I think that is one of the things that we sometimes miss when we're trying to reason about um, software and what we are doing. There is the empirical aspect on a day-to-day -day basis, but there is also the knowledge of the past. And again, I, I start, open the talk by saying we don't learn from the past. So let's go back to 1968. The software engineering conference, the NATO software engineering conference, um, people often cite this but without necessarily reading the proceeds of this. There's this lovely observation back in the 1960s. The design process is an iterative one. That is the lesson here because we cannot know everything that we need to know in advance. And we need to understand and be given the time to learn from it, often by doing and implementing what we are actually doing. So I'm going to leave the talk there. We've traveled a long way from the starting point. That is our, that is our road. That is how we drive. We drive by paying attention. We drive by this mix. Uh, you, you drive by having a mixed view of your um, uh, detail. You have a big picture. Here I am. This is where I want to go. I may have an original plan, but like driving with Google Maps, I have alternative paths in case there are problems. But I also review where I am. I keep my eye on the details as they occur. I don't say I've just got a big plan. I'm going to drive from, I live in Bristol. I'm going to drive from Bristol to London. That's about 200 kilometers. And I'm only going to focus on the big picture. No, I also watch the cars in front of me as I drive. Um, you need to pay attention to the road as it happens. The same kind of attention to detail and value and responding to change is necessary, uh, if not more so, uh, in code than it is in driving. So I'm going to call that the talk. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions now.